All right, everybody. Welcome to tonight's stream. Um, Monday. Been a long day. <laughs> um, so um, it was nonstop meetings for me all day today. Um, which, you know, for better or for worse, I made it through it. We're good. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be here streaming. I'm instead of in a meeting. So thank you everybody for joining me. Uh, I'm just getting things all set up as we um, as we take a look at what's going on. Um, analog upgraded, um, NX upgraded, and then the Angular CLI also upgraded along with the schematics. Um, and I had a meeting that ran right up until um, right up until I usually get ready to start streaming. Um, and um, I decided to grab some dinner because uh, I was very, very hungry. Hadn't had a chance to eat. Um, so um, I'm just finishing up the stuff that I typically do just before stream. Um, and we've still got this upgrade um, with the, the tan stack in it. Um, still has issues um and what i've been having to do is just tell it hey for the tan stack stuff still use the 1.0 beta 5. um i don't know why it's trying to grab the 1.02 here um but this has been the fix so if you're using analog and you're using nx migrate um you might have to do something similar um, it took me a little while to figure out it on stream a little while ago, but um, it, the fix is pretty simple, so it should be good. Uh, today, we are going to get into actually building out the content piece of the blog. Uh, so that, you know, they can jump in and look at a full article. Actually, no, there were a couple of things... Um, identified yesterday on stream that I want to take a look at. Um, let's go, well, and yesterday on stream was the first time I was um, able to use the uh, analog plugin for analog files. Um, and it's pretty good. And it identified something that we can do better um, in our application. So we'll take a look at that first. Um, there was one other thing, and I'm not thinking of it right now, um, but um, we'll, we'll take a look at those two fixes. I'll, I'll probably remember it when we jump into the code. Um, I hope. Um, so we upgraded um, analog.js. Um, and I don't want to jump into, um, so I think there are a couple of upgrades left. Um, so yeah, there's, I'm not sure if this Vite upgrade is going to cause us problems. So we're going to skip that. Um, I'm also not sure if this marked or the SWC helpers will cause us problems. Um, so we're just going to grab the TypeScript um, ESLint stuff. Um, and that should be everything we need to do. Um, and then we'll, we'll see if we can serve and hopefully I haven't broken anything right as we're starting the stream. So um, there we go. We're all upgraded. Um, let's get that all committed. Um, Upgrade dependencies. And, oh, I remember what it was. Um, at, at, at ng-conf, they talked about, um, as part of the SSR stuff for um, Angular, um, they talked about merging in Wiz, um, which 
uh, will give us some cool streaming um, capabilities, similar to like what Quick does um, once it's in place, which is super exciting. So I'd like to get the SSR stuff working also um, within our blog. Um, I disabled that. So we'll need to go back and take a look at what we need to do to get that enabled. So server-side rendering, um, and we're going to fix up an issue that was caught by um, was caught by the WebStorm um, analog plugin, which was really cool. Um, but first, let's just see if we can serve. So let's serve our blog and just make sure everything pops up. We don't have any console errors. There were so many weird errors yesterday. Um, some of them were caused by us. Um, some of them were not caused by us. Um, one of the things we had to do... Um, yeah, so this error is a little bit frustrating, um, and I need to get it reported. Um, but it's trying to... Um, it's trying to reach C colon backslash C colon backslash, which if you know a Windows file system, this is wrong. Um, the, this is the real. Um, so it's, it's prepending another drive to it, and I don't know why, um, but I, I do need to get that one reported. Um, but let's take a look at this and see if it serves. Um, so here we go. Here is our blog um, with the, you know, with in all its glory with um, the styling in place. It doesn't look like our console is broken. And we do have some stuff about hydration. Um, it looks like we can swap our themes. And if we refresh, everything seems to be happy. Come to the articles. Oh, this is another thing that's broken. Um, this link right here is not working. I'm not sure why, so we'll take a look at that too. Um, but the header link should be taking us back. Um, and I think I know what's going on here. Let's actually start with that one. Um, so... Go back to the tools and let's launch WebStorm. Um, I'm running um, the release candidate um, of WebStorm. Um, so I haven't updated my other tools. Um, I'll update that in a little bit. Um, but one thing we had to do was convert our header component from an analog file over to an actual component. Um, and within this component, um, we've got this router link. Oh, and it even highlighted it for me. Um, well, did it? I've got the common module. Um, do I need to? Im Let's import router link. So there we go. I don't think router link is in Angular Common. I actually don't know why we're using Angular Common. Um, do I need the common module? Let me just take it out and see what we lose. Um, I think the common module was just added by the import stuff, and I don't think we really need the common module. We're not using ng-if, we're not using ng-4. I mean, we are using the four, um, what do we want to, like the, the four structural, um, structural um, load control. Um, we are using four for that. Um, but everything else, I don't think we need the common module. So go ahead and refresh. Um, 
Yeah, and now that we click, now we're back. So we were missing that, and we can see over here that we're not getting any errors. Um, the app component rendered, that's coming from... Here, we're calling the after next render. Um, I don't think we need that either, so we can probably take out this entire constructor. Um, that was a test that we were doing when Chow was on the stream. Um, so we'll clean that up. Um, I am now in the habit of cleaning up my um, console. Um, I just like to not have errors and stuff there, so. There we go, that's all working. Go back to sunset, and that is all working. Header component.ts. We're logging an event in our header component. Let's go take a look at that. Header component.ts. Oh, yep, we are logging this event. Oh, and there is a reason why I was logging that event. Um, because we added this click handler for this the theme selected, um, and the event is coming through. Um, and we were we were cheating before um, because it wasn't strongly typed in the analog component. Um, the event is coming through as just an event. Um, What is the event? Let's just see what kind of event it is. We'll add a typo on it. Um, I think it's an HTML input event, um, but I just want to make sure. Um, go ahead and change that. Object, thank you. Um, It is not just an object. Um, I think this is an HTML change event. No. Input. Um, Is there an input event? There is an input event. Maybe that's the one I want. Because I think the input event has a target on it. It does. There's my event target. So now I can take this piece off, the as any. does not exist on event target. Um, <clears throat> I think this can be um, a generic, and I think we can do an HTML select element. Um, no. This event.target, what is the event up here? Um, it's just an event. Is it really just an event on change? It is just an event.
So, me doing this causes problems. Um, and what we're looking for, um, so here, oh, I guess event does have an event target on it. Um, of the event interface is a reference to the object in which the event was dispatched. It is different from the current target when the event handler is called during bubbling. Yeah. Um, so the issue we have here is that value um, does not exist on type event target. Um, but it does exist on type event target. Um, and we we can see this. Um, we go look at MDN. Um, MDN event target. So it points to the element. Oh. So it is true. Event target really only has these methods on it. Um, and then it inherits the rest. Um, what are these options? Form with options object supported. Um, dispatch event. We need to tell it that the event target is um, an HTML select. And that way, um, the, the reason that it doesn't know about um, value is like a div doesn't have a value on it, right? Um, or span or something like that. Um, and so event target is a very generic um, and I'm curious, can I tell? No. So event is not generic. Um, and we can see what's on it, right? We've got whether or not it can bubbles, whether it can cancel. Um, and the target is an event target. Um, I don't want to cast it, and that, that's what I'm trying to avoid, um, is I don't like to cast to any like I had it before. Um, so, like, one thing we could do um, is we could say if... Um, oh, look at that. Event.target... Um, is instance of HTML select element. No, that's not, I didn't want a header component. I want HTML select element. Um, and I don't think we use is. I think it's just instance of that. Um, then it's going to basically now we know that it's a select. Um, and so here, um, it's now going to have the value on it. Um, the other thing that it's telling us is that this has been narrowed. Um, and so the question mark isn't necessary. Um, but this instance of is a little bit dangerous. Because instance of, well, let's, let's go take a look at MDN, right? I mean, on MDN, MDN, if we look at instance of. Um, so the instance of looks at the prototype. Um, and so when, when you say that it's a prototype, um, 
you can actually change the prototype of a JavaScript object at runtime, which is kind of crazy to think about, but that you know makes the instance of operator um, a little bit less safe. Um, and that's why, um, right, so we, we look at the constructor prototype. Um, and usually this isn't an issue, but um, I'm, I'm one of those people who likes to deal in technicalities. Um, it, I feel like it helps me write um, safer code. Um, if you can technically change my prototype, then I can't really trust my instance of, right? Um, and so what do we do about that, right? Or there are other places where they may not even be maliciously trying to change the prototype, um, but it might cause problems. There, there's some inheritance issues that you can run into. Um, um, so objects created using object.create. Object um, so here with instance of, it's true, it's a rectangle, but it's not a string. Um, and this, yeah, this is crazy here. Um, this is another crazy thing to be aware of, um, is that the instance of operator has a lower precedence than the not operator. Um, so this code technically says not my car, uh, which if my car is an object, this becomes false is an instance of car. Um, and since false will not be on, oh, it's even explaining it right here. Uh, but yeah, instance of has a lower um, operator precedence than the not operator, um, which is crazy. Um, and then people can override how instance of behaves and just stuff like that. Um, so I've come to distrust instance of, and I don't, I don't think you guys should, um, but if you're like me and you distrust instance of, we can write our own guard clause, right? Um, and so we can say, Hey, function is, um, HTML, or we can say has, um, value, right? Um, and here we can say um, HTML or event target. Um, and here we're going to say that it's unknown. Um, and our return type here is that event target um, is, and really we're just going to be checking if it has a value. Um, so here we're just going to say value unknown, right? Um, because we don't really care what value is. Um, we'll, we'll let the, we'll let the compiler worry about that. Um, so the first thing we want to do is, um, well, we just want to return, um, yeah, we can, we can say, um, we could say not not um, event target um, and event target dot um, has own property value. That works. Um, and do not access. Oh yeah. Um, and so. Oh, that's a good point. Um, it's saying don't call the um, has own property explicitly. Um, instead, use the object dot prototype um, dot call. Um, and the reason for that um, is if we go take a look here, um, that should take us to the page. Or did that not? Um, um, oh, that's the fix. 
Um, open in documentation tool window. Um, no, that's not what we want. Um, so we'll just go look this up. There used to be a way to just jump to the documentation. Um, we'll just go look up this um, ESLint no prototype built-ins. Um, and we can, we can figure out, right? Um, so part of the reason why I like to use linters um, is I like to learn why the rules are there. Um, and so here's the, here's the rule from ESLint. Uh, and so, you know, disallow calling some object.prototype methods. Um, it's part of ESLint recommended. Um, so yeah, object.create allows you to create, um, you know, specified prototypes as a common pattern. Um, and we can say that, hey, this object doesn't have a prototype, which means if they create this, this, this is called like an object stamp or an object factory. Um, and it's, it's a way to stamp out objects of certain shapes. Um, and if we create it with a null prototype, then um, calling, you know, object.hasOwn property is going to say, hey, you can't call has own property on this because it doesn't exist um, because the prototype will be null. We, we created a null prototype. Um, and so it, it adds a subtle bug. Um, or another interesting one is like if you deserialize from JSON and they, um, you know, they give you has own property and they give you a value that's not the function, um, we can crash also. So there are a couple different ways that um, using has own property by itself can cause problems. Um, and that's why, you know, this is the safer way to do it. Um, and these are good reminders. These, these also teach you some interesting edge cases and gotchas, like gotchas in, um, in TypeScript and, well, this is ECMAScript, right? ESLint. Um, TypeScript's just on top of that. But um, you'll learn interesting gotchas here, and it, it makes you a better de um, developer. So, um, I mean, technically, you could ignore it because in most cases, it's not going to be an issue. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a safer way to go. Um, and so now, because we've written a guard clause and the guard clause tells us that, hey, we've got a value, um, now we can say if has value, um, and here we just pass it event dot target. Um, now we can see that we're fine, right? Um, value is unknown. Um, and we could go even deeper. Um, so we could make this so that we don't even have to do this cast here because this cast is technically dangerous too because if value came through as like a Boolean or something like that, um, this cast would break, right? Um, so here we could say that it has a theme value. Um, and then we could say event.target is value and then we can say theme. Um, and so um, cannot find, okay, yeah, it has theme value now, right? So right now it, it's working, but we actually aren't testing for the, um, for, that the property is of type theme. Um, so the first thing we can do is we can just say, hey, if not event target, right? 
So if it's falsy, um, then we're just going to return false. Um, and that takes out this first part of our complicated return. Um, the next thing we can say is, hey, if um, not object, well, we can just copy this up here. Um, then again, we're going to return false. Um, and we're, we're using the early return, um, we're using the early return pattern here. Um, and so now all we've got left is now we know that we've got an object and we know that this object has a target. Um, so the next thing we can do is we can say, um, you know, if event target dot value, um, and here we can say if type of event target dot value um, is not equal um, string, um, then we can return false. Um, So it's not able to figure out that, um, oh, that's interesting. It can't narrow based on this has own property call. Um, um, TypeScript can't. And that's why here, um, all we know is that this is an object. Um, we don't know that it's got a property type of value. Um, so, um, what we can do is we can put this all back to the way it was. Um, And here we've got the has value, um, but we want the has theme value. Um, so we can say function has theme value. Um, and again, we're going to use that and Copilot figured it out for us. Um, so here we could say if not has value event target, then we're going to return false. Um, otherwise, we can say um, if um, yeah, if it doesn't equal a string, we're going to return false also. And now we're getting the green highlight because this guard clause has narrowed it. Um, and this is a nice part of um, this is a nice part of um, WebStorm. That WebStorm will do this highlighting for you um, when you've narrowed a variable. Um, which gives you good visual feedback that you know something has happened. Um, so the last thing we want to do is we want to return, um, and that actually will do it. Um, and themes is not callable, um, yeah, because it's just an array. Um, and um, so this is, um, this is a fun one, right? Because, um, the includes on this read only array should allow us to, um, check if a string value is in there. Um, it doesn't like what I'm doing, right? Because it's saying, hey, the, the value of string is not one of these arrays. And the reason we can do this, um, 
is because we set up our themes to be a constant um, array as const. And that as const is what narrows it down. So when we hover over themes, we can see that, hey, it's a read-only array, and it can only be these values. Um, so we're, we're type narrowing to only the string values that are inside of this array. Um, and that gives us a cool ability to say, hey, theme, right, is type of themes with the indexer of number, um, which in an array, you know, it, a number indexer is what indexes these values. Um, and so TypeScript, you know, tells us, oh, yeah, this is just light, dark, cupcake, right? All of these possible themes. Um, So, um, includes, so it wants our search element to be one of these values because the read only array dot includes, this is the generic here, right? On the, the theme values. Um, We can just say as any here. And this is one of the places where casting to any I tend to allow. Um, see, it wants me to use unknown or something like that, right? Or never, but oh, never works. Why does never? As theme value. Um, and now we can take off the cast, right? Because our type guard is making sure that our value um, is a specific type, right? It, our event target has a value and that value is a theme. So we've gone through and we duct taped or duct tape, duct typed a lot of this stuff. Um, and this is the this is the cool thing about type guards um, is that when written properly, um, you get runtime safety, right? Because we first check if we have a value. If we don't, that returns false. Um, so you know, there's our first return. Um, and the other thing that I recommend doing in cases like this is, um, you know, write these out a lot, you know, in long form. They're easier to reason about because I could easily have nested a bunch of ternaries here. Um, and if your team likes ternaries and um, they're, they're fine with it, then, you know, use ternaries. But if they don't, um, you know, write it out. Um, the other thing, you know, we could we could potentially do if we um, um, we could say hey copilot um, where do I have chat yep I do and inside of here hey um, can I optimize this um, type guard now let's see what copilot comes back with right um, so you know, if if you're using AI, um, um, oh, so it's it's saying, hey, we could make this a compound um, return statement, right? Um, so here we could say return has value, um, event target, and it's a string, right? This one, and it includes the value, um, right? So this is a compound. I This one comes down to your team's preference, right? Um, because of the way AND works um, in, in JavaScript and a lot of other languages, right? If this evaluates to false, it's not going to evaluate anything beyond the AND. Um, so it's going to fall out here, which is very similar to what we're doing here with the if statement. Um, 
So this one really comes down to team preference. Um, I tend to prefer writing it out like this um, because the truth tables on logic like this can get really, really complicated. Um, and people, people have a hard time reasoning about like, you know, and, and, or, and, or, or things like that, right? Um, so that's why I tend to avoid these. If your team likes them and, and prefers them, then write, write it this way. Um, you know, um, be consistent with what your team wants to do. Um, but in my opinion, there's not a lot of difference between these two. And the other thing is that since um, TypeScript is a, um, a transpiled language, um, the transpiler is probably going to make these optimizations for us. And if the transpiler doesn't, then um, my bet is that when it gets minified, this will be made for us anyway. Um, so writing code that's not, um, you know, that's not optimized, or that, you know, optimizing code um, may not be in your best interest because, you know, the minimized code will probably do the same thing. Um, so I tend to like to write code that, that's readable, right? Um, and keep my complexity low. Um, so, you know, that, that's me on my, um, actually missing some stuff here, um, some settings. But that's okay. Um, so this is the NX stuff using um, outdated stuff that it, um, I'm sure it'll be updated for once WebStorm is on full release. Um, so let's let's go test this right and make sure that it all behaves. Um, that I haven't broken anything. Um, So here we go, we're back up. Um, let's change it to forest. And we didn't change. Um, change it back to sunset. And we didn't change. So we've broken something here. Um, my, my bet is it's this as never. Um, I want to see, like, I'm not 100% certain about what this turns into. Um, so let's go, let's go take this code and um, we'll throw it into um, TypeScript Lang um, in the playground. And... Um, Here, we're just going to declare um, theme as um, string or declare theme. I think we can do string array. Um, and we're going to declare type theme equals a string array, and that's fine. Um, and we're going to declare. Um, const themes as a string array and there we go so that gets rid of you know the the variables there um, what i want to see is what this compiles down to oh that's interesting it does So this as never doesn't cause us issues. Um, so it is compiling down to something that I would expect. Um, so let's just um, here, let's console.log um, event target.value. Um, and then we're also going to log themes. Um, and just see what we get. If we don't get here, then we've broken something else. Um, so here we go. We'll change this over to forest. So we aren't even making it there. 
Um, so has the value, we know we're calling into here. Um, no, we don't even know that. We know we're getting here. Um, so let's just see here. Uh, you know what? I'm a, I'm a console logger, <laughs> um, and I like to use console logs. Um, but we can actually go into the code here, and let's pop this out. Um, and... Um, so here is our problem here. So we'll step into this code and just see what we get, right? Um, so let's go ahead and we'll just change it um, to Aqua. And so here we are, um, our event.target. Um, our event.target.value is Aqua, which we chose. Um, so we're going to step into this. Um, so here, we're going to step into the has value, right? Um, so it's going to say we do have this. Um, and we do have the value property. Um, so when we step into this, oh, oh, remember how I told you that complicated logic messes people up? Well, it just messed me up. Um, so has own property. Um, Let's go ahead and just hit escape here. Um, and if we look, um, we can just right here, we can just run object dot prototype. Oops. Object um, dot prototype dot has own property dot call. And here we're going to call it on event target. Um, and we're going to say it needs to have the value property. Um, and it's false. It's not its own property. It's an inherited property. So um, if we look. Value. No, it is a property. And I thought it was coming off of the prototype. Oh, maybe it is. Um, oh, it is. It's a it's a property coming from the um, prototype. Um, so it doesn't have its own property. We can change this, right? We can say, um, instead of has own property, we can say has property. Um, is it um, event target has property? No. Um, Isn't there a has property in um Let's go look here. It has own property. Oh, it might just be has own. Um
<clears throat> oh. Hazone is even better, though. Um... If the property is inherited, um, see, our property is inherited, and that's the problem. Um, So that that's probably we probably want to use the in operator here instead. Um, so instead of using has own property, because what we're looking for is an inherited property, um, we can say and value in event target. Um, And it doesn't like that. So now we have to say type of event target equals object. It, it really wants us to go um, because null type of null is object. Um, so we also have to say event target does not equal null. And in this instance, um, I'm using not the triple equals because I do want the coercion for both um, null and undefined. Um, but now it should work because, um, there we go. So now if I change it to forest, now we work. Um, now if we change it to sunset, we work again, right? Um, and the reason for that is, um, we were inheriting, um, and that's, so has own and has own property only tell you um, only return true if the property is in the prototype of that specific object. If it's further up the chain, meaning it's inherited, um, then we've got a problem, right? Um, and so we, we were failing and um, Man, it's there, there's there's so much to know in JavaScript and TypeScript, um, and you know if you're an interviewer, don't ask these kinds of questions in an interview. Um, you know I'm I'm a staff level engineer, um, and I make these mistakes all the time. Um, so you know asking this kind of stuff is kind of you know trivia. You're you're asking trivia stuff to people. Um, so. Um, But to recap, what did you know? What did we do? Um, well, the first thing we can do is clean this all out. Um, clean out our logging because we don't need it anymore. Um, and we got a little bit distracted, but what we did is we created this type guard, right? H has theme, um, and has theme tells us that hey, we've got a value that is of type theme, um, and we did that by duct tape typing, right? So the first thing we do is we just check does event target have a value property, right? Um, and has value is probably a bad name, um, has value property, right? Um, and that's all that this does. Um, so we check that it's not null or undefined with this check. Then we check that it's an object 
And then, you know, once we know it's not null or undefined and it is an object, then we can check, hey, does the value property exist in the event target object? Um, if this is all true, then we're going to get true. If any of these are false, then we'll get false. Um, and then up here, we're using the early return pattern, right, where um, if we don't have this, we return false. Here, again, if we don't, if it's not a string, we return false. And then finally, we check if our themes include that value. We're using as never here. Um, as never is a really interesting cast. Um, so if we go look at like um, TypeScript as never cast. Um, we'll, we'll see what Gemini comes up with first, right? Um, so the as never cast in TypeScript is a way to tell the compiler that a value can never occur, right? <laughs> um, but this isn't even, so what this is doing, and this is, this is good, right? Um, so on throw, throw, because we're throwing an error here, there won't be a return value for this function. So we can say this function has a return value of never, that there will never be a return value. Um, and this gives us type safety because in like JavaScript and ECMAScript, um, any function that doesn't throw and doesn't return has an, an implicit undefined return type. Um, but this is wrong. We aren't casting the as never here. Um, this is telling us about the, the never return type. Um, so yeah, so here, we try to assign the value null to the variable, we will get an error. Yeah, is to prevent variables from being assigned values that cannot possibly have. For example, variables that can only be assigned true or false, boom, we try to assign null, we will get an error. Compiler will tell us the type null is not assignable to the type boolean. This is because, yep, boolean can only be true or false. We can use as never to prevent this error. Um, this tells the compiler we know the variable can never be assigned the value of null, so it's okay to assign it the value null. Right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. Does that actually work? I've never done this. So if I do bool, um, or I do const test and it's of type Boolean, right? Um, and I say this equals true, we're good, right? If I say it equals JSON, then it's wrong. But if I say, hey, no, as never, oh, wow. Um, so I learned something today. <laughs> this is stupid. Um, But we're basically telling the compiler, yeah, this can never happen, so just go ahead and do it. <laughs> um, what an interesting way to handle that. Um, and this is why I recommend going down rabbit holes, right? Um, because I wasn't certain what this would do, but it's basically me telling it, yeah, I know it can never be um, a value that's not in these, but I want you to test it anyway, right? Um, I, I would prefer that includes, because it's just a Boolean, whether this array includes it or not. And if I give it a value that can't be in the array, it can just return false, right? And that's the way it works in ECMAScript and TypeScript. If the value isn't in the array, we just get false back. Um, the fact that TypeScript 
doesn't allow me to write code like this um, is a little bit frustrating. And like, I can't do undefined here too, right? Um, this doesn't work, even though I know this should be false. And if I write this outside of TypeScript, this will definitely be false. Um, but TypeScript saying this isn't assignable to that. Well, yeah, I'm checking that the value that I've got is in this array. Um, do we have the same problem with index of? Um, like themes.index of. Um, yeah, so we're getting the same issue here. Um, but that's like, I've got this array. Um, and I don't want to cast it to a theme. I don't want to cast it at all. Um, I've determined that it's a string. And that should be good enough. Um, and this is, um, this is where I think a lot of people um, a lot of people get frustrated with uh, with TypeScript because TypeScript is angry because yeah I can't do this well I know I can't um, you know I I know I can't put a value into themes that isn't something that I told it it could have but I can definitely check themes and say hey. Does JSON exist in themes? No, it doesn't. Great, give me false. I, you know, that, that's what I want back. If my value isn't in themes, give me false. Um, so I'm curious, like if I do, um, yeah, let's go, let's go to Copilot chat and let's just say, hey, um, can this be written without casting? Um, I don't think, I don't know that it can. Um, uh, <laughs> you're wrong. If all these conditions are met, but this is what we've already done, right? Um, there, we're checking that it's an object. There, we're saying it's not null. Here, we've got the value. So this is handled here. Here is the type of string check, which we've added here. Um, this line is broken. Um, we can prove that by... Um, Let's just copy this code block and we can just throw this code block in here, right? Um, and we get the same error, right? Um, so Copilot's wrong here. Um, and it's cool that it's using these files as references, but this is wrong. Um, um, so um, themes dot includes um, event target dot value complains about it not being the right type. Um, we'll give it some feedback, right? Well, yeah, I know it doesn't. And so now it's telling me, hey, tell it that it's a theme, right? So really, the as operator doesn't matter in the JavaScript. And we can see that um, if we go back to TypeScript lang. Um, so I could just as easily say, hey, this is a theme. Um, and we're fine because there's enough overlap between string and theme 
for this to work, right? Um, I can't say that like um, 25 is a theme, right? Because it's going to tell me there's not enough overlap between um, number and, um, you know, number and this array of strings. Um, but where this is a string and, you know, there's enough overlap between string and array of strings, um, then, then it'll allow that. So this is a little bit more type safe than what I had before with the never. Um, but in the end, it doesn't matter, um, right? If I do as Boolean and maybe I do zero as Boolean, and it doesn't like that, but I can do not zero as Boolean, right? Um, we can see that this cast doesn't really matter. Um, it does matter if you do something like unknown, um, because now it's going to say, hey, unknown is not as assignable to type Boolean. Um, so unknown is a little bit dangerous in these casts. Um, never, this is kind of scary to me that you can do this because I don't see the difference between casting to never versus any. Um, I would prefer to do the cast to the matching type here. Um, and that way, you know, the code is going to be the same, but we're going to get some help from um, TypeScript if we if we mess the type up too much, right? Um, so if I were to take the not off of this, um, now it's going to tell us, hey, you know, number and Boolean because they don't sufficiently overlap with each other. Um, and that's where you get like this weird stuff too. Uh, and I've written code like this. Um, and I know other people have written code like this. Like in the end, it doesn't matter. Um, because basically what we're saying here is, yeah, I know better than you what the type is, even though you're, you know, parsing my AST trees and all of that stuff. I don't know. Um, be careful with your typings, right? Um, there, there are ways to break the, the TypeScript type system. Um, I like to avoid any... Um, because any basically means that here I could put um, um, this and now my code is broken, right? Um, and where this would become really crazy is if I did a number, right? And then um, here I did a console.log. Um, and um, your result equals, and then, you know, I did one plus um, test, right? Um, when we run this, we're going to get one JSON, right? Or actually now it's one object object. It's not even one JSON, right? This is really messed up. Um, and now if I tried to use this somewhere that was expecting a number, now we're in an even weirder issue. Um, hey, Bruno, thank you. Um, let's see this video later. Thanks to you. Um, I'm starting following you on GitHub. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. Um, I appreciate that. Um, you, you have a good night. I know it's late um, in a lot of the, the world where people watch these videos. Um, and that's why I started doing YouTube at the same time as Twitch, um, because, you know, YouTube's going to stick around a bit longer. Twitch only allows me to keep my VODs up for two weeks and then they delete them. Um, and I am extremely bad at getting this stuff up to, um, getting this stuff up to YouTube. Um, so I figure if I just stream to both, they'll be up on YouTube. Um, and then, you know, when I get in and I edit it and I chop off the beginning and stuff like that, um, it, it helps people out who come in and rewatch it. Um, but you know, if I get lazy, at least the videos are there and you can come back and rewatch and link to stuff. So thank you for the feedback, Bruno. Um, you have a great night. Um, and, and, you know, thank you for following me on GitHub. Um, 
yeah, we are. Um, this stuff is important. Um, really, as a library author, it's very, very difficult to avoid any. And sometimes the hoops that you jump through to avoid any aren't worth what you get out of it. Um, so as a library author, you should absolutely use any. Um, I'm not going to, you know, be here and be like, thou shalt not use any, right? Uh, I'm not going to lay down a commandment like that. What I am going to suggest um, is in your production code, um, avoid any like the plague. Um, it, it is kind of, um, it is kind of an, a plague. Once you start using any, it starts to infect everything, right? Um, so if I were to take this off, right? Um, now me casting this as any, test is type any, right? Um, and so this is type any. And now we're getting all sorts of weird messes, right? Um, whereas if I were to take this out, TypeScript suddenly goes, hey, did you really mean to add a number and an object? Because that seems strange, um, right? And you're going to get weird results. Um, and so, you know, once, once you add just a simple as any, anywhere in your code, that any starts just going everywhere, right? Because like here, if I do const um you know addition or um result equals one plus um test again any right because any of any basically infects your code and that's why i'm really against it library authors can't avoid this very easily um, but usually where you're using any's in libraries um, TypeScript's able to make good inferences when you do it. Um, but in your code that's going to go to production, um, once you start to use any, it, it just it goes all over the place. And you may not even realize how that one tiny little any can show up all over the place and just ruin your type safety. Um, so be really, really, really careful about how you um, how you do your casting. And that's why, you know, the reason we, we went down this rabbit hole is one, until today, I didn't know really what as never does. And as never scares the crap out of me because it's the same as as um, it's it's basically the same as um, as any um, in a lot of cases. It's not really technically that right, because if I do as never here. Um, then the value of test is never, the value of result, oh, is number. That's bad. That's really bad. That's really bad. Um, be very careful with this cast, as never. Um, I'm not going to say don't use it because it exists because um, there are important times to use it. But I didn't realize that this plus never is going to give me a number. That's not true, right? When we run this, we can absolutely see we get a string. My code tells me I'm going to get a number because I broke the type system here with my cast, this cast to as never. Um, and basically as never is just telling the type system, hey, I know what I'm doing. I know better than you. Um, just do what I told you to, even though you probably shouldn't. Um, there are good reasons to use this, I'm sure. Um, I've never actually used them. So I can't give you ideas of what those are. Um, I'd have to do more reading. Um, but I would prefer to get infected by any, right? So this is any, and this is any, 
Um, I would much rather prefer to get infected by any. Um, I was expecting to see the same result here, right? When I saw that this was type never, I was expecting this to be type never. I did not expect it to be type number. Um, I'm curious if I flip these around, um, because in, in JavaScript and ECMAScript, the order of the operands affects the type coercion. Um, so here, type of result is still number. Um, that's really interesting. Um, I'm sure there's a reason for this. Um, I just don't know what it is. And this is a little bit scary. Um, be very, very careful with as never. Um, you're basically telling the system this should never happen. So yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, crazy. Um, I need to do some more research to figure out, you know, what would be a good, good time and good place to do that. Um, instead, cast it this way, right? Casts are really just hints to the type system. Um, but at least here, when we cast it as a theme, um, if we don't get significant enough overlap, like if I take out this test right here, um, oh, it doesn't care. Value is unknown. Um, so why would value be unknown? Oh, because Um, because it, it is unknown. It doesn't know what type it is. Um, this check isn't that important, really, right? Because um, if we go here um, and um, I do like I don't know, four comma five comma six dot includes. Um, and here I can do name, Jason. Um, and that's going to be false, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't care about the type. So me checking that it's a string didn't really give us a benefit, right? Um, if I do four here, it's going to be false, right? Um, if I do four, plus zero, it's false. But the crazy thing is if I do zero plus four, oh. I may need to update my um, interesting. Um, four comma five comma six, but includes um, four. Um, that's false. If you just add a plus to it, that converts it to a number. Um, but if I do zero plus four, that's interesting. What is zero plus four? And it just may be the, yeah, zero, four, okay. Um, so the order of the operands uh, doesn't matter here. Where the order of the operands matters is like, if I do zero point, um, like zero, 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 five um, plus four, we get that, right? Um, but if we swap them around, Um, what do I keep thinking of? Maybe it's in multiplication. I need to remember what I'm thinking of. 
there is there is a time when like float versus integer matters um and the order of your operands matters because the coercion is based on um and plus may not like the the uh, math operators may not be that way um Something's nagging at the back of my mind. I'll think of it. Um, but anyway, getting back to things. Casting, in the end, um, doesn't matter for the transpiled code. Um, the way we cast, though, can have radical effects on the typing system, as we saw, right? If we change this to as never, um, Unless you know a specific use case and you have a specific use case for as never, I would suggest that as any is safer in the type system than as never. Um, specifically, um, because of this case right here where never gets turned into a number. Um, that is a particularly scary case for me. Um, yeah, that, that, that one just really, really scares me. Um, as a, as a senior engineer, um, trying to keep my code under control and trying to keep the type system happy, um, and catching errors, I would much rather be infected with an any than having somebody swapping types under my nose and causing potentially undefined system behavior. Um, this one scares me a lot, I'm going to admit, and that's why I keep coming back to it. Um, but let's, let's, um, let's commit our code. Um, we've got our um, type guard in place. Um, and um, we'll, we'll commit this. Um, our type guard is a lot more type safe than it originally started out with. Um, so we'll stage that. Um, and we'll stage that. And we'll say we fixed um, router link in header and made a uh, it deems um, more type safe, or it's actually more runtime um, safe. Um, they they were they were fairly type safe before, but um, we've added more runtime safety um, by by duck typing um, this variable um, and using it as um, a type guard. Um, and um, because um, ECMAScript is such a dynamic language, um, the really, really the only way to be certain at runtime of the shape of the object that you've got is duct typing. You can't rely on prototypes. You can't rely on, um, you know, you can't rely on casting because casting is really a, a TypeScript thing. Um, it, it will give you some compile time safety, but really the only way to be certain in ECMAScript is to go and, you know, does it look like a duck? Does it walk like a duck? Does it quack like a duck? Okay, it's a duck, right? Uh, that's duck typing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, this is why I like streaming because I learned a whole bunch tonight. Um, and um, I didn't even intend to go down this path. So um, I really, really like this. Um, this complexity stuff here is coming from WebStorm. I turned on um, a property that gives me some information about methods. Um, and it's telling me about the complexity of this method. Um, I think this is a CRC number. Um, well, let's let's look. Um, if I go here and I look at complexity, um, so here's the cognitive complexity. Can I go into that? Um, 
So enable cognitive complexity calculation. So high complexity is at 15. Um, so, oh, this came from better highlights. This isn't WebStorm. I added better highlights a little while ago. Um, that's where the cognitive complexity is coming from. Um, better highlights gives us gives me a way to write comments, um, so um, I can mark them as, you know, important. Um, a question. Um, these these different things mark my comments different ways, um, and we can add. Um, regular expressions that might do something special. Um, we can also add links to like outside code. Um, and then with this plugin, it will render them as links. Um, and then, you know, icons and stuff that we can apply. Uh, so I think this is a CRC complexity. Um, um, and if you guys don't know what a CRC complexity is, um, it's a way of calculating the complexity of your code. Um, so um, we'll see what Gemini comes up with, but um, yeah, it's a cyclic redundancy check. Um, and basically, each byte of packet da data. Um, that is not what I'm looking for. Um, computational complexity. Basically, what it does um, is it goes through and looks at your code, and every if statement is a new branch. Every um, um, every loop is a new branch, and things like that. And then you count up the number of branches. And maybe I'm thinking like CRC might not be the right one. Um, code complexity calculation. Um, yeah, psych oh, I, I always I always add the extra C in there. It's cyclomatic complexity. It's not CRC. CRC is a way to um, you know, guarantee packet safety um, and things like that, where you can measure, you know, um, how likely you are to have um, errors in the code based on, um, you know, the CRC code and what, what you get on your end. Um, so, yeah, the edge cases uh, minus the number of nodes plus the number of connected components. Um, and basically what this comes down to is um, if statements add more complexity, switch statements add more complexity, um, loop statements add more complexity, and you start adding up that, um, that complexity. Um, and that gives you a number. Um, and, you know, according to a lot of places, a 15 is really high. That basically means that you've got like 15 branches and, or, you know, like, if you've ever seen that meme of, um, you know, Ryu from Street Fighter throwing the fireball at the if statement that's a big arrow like that, um, that's a high CRC complexity. Because testing that is ridiculous, right? Um, and they even go into that here, right? Um, should be less than 10 for most cases. Above 10 is enough to refactor the code. Like, a lot of people have... Um, have a good hard rule around that. I just like to be aware of my um, my cyclomatic 
complexity um, because um, it, it allows me to think, okay, um, as this number goes up, I've got more tests to write. And we, we can look at that, right? So like has theme value um, has two cases here, right? Um, either this returns a true or a false. So that's, that's two branches. Um, and then here, um, well, there's only one, one branch. So I think this is a, this is a cyclomatic complexity of two, um, uh, because there's this branch and then there's this branch. Um, and then this one also has, um, a cyclomatic complexity of two because, you know, of the test cases we've got it right here. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm trying to calculate this in my head. Um, and we at least have the same. Um, anyway, I like to keep track of these numbers, um, not because the numbers themselves matter, but as this goes up, I know that my code is getting more complicated. It's harder to think about. It's hard, much more difficult to write tests for, right? Um, and I'm not sure about this because here, event target could be null. That's one case, right, that drops out of here. It could not be null. That's two cases. Um, here, event target, we know it's not null, but it could be an object. That's a third case. Or it could not be an object. That's a fourth case. So already I have four unit tests for this that I need to write. And then the last case is value could be in event target, right? Or it could not. I have six tests that I need to write for this code. Um, and, you know, it, so the complexity, I would prefer to see, and maybe I can do that, right? So if I go here. Um, I'm curious, like, I would actually like to see the actual complexity um, rather than this percentage. Because there, there are six cases here that I would need to go through. Um, here, has value property, if I mock it, um, I could return a true or a false. Um, so that, that's two cases, right? And then themes.includes could return a true or a false. Um, but really that's one, this is one way through. So there's only three branches here um, because we're only going to return the includes. Um, and the includes is another function. So we don't want to test the true or false here because if we test both cases for true and false, then what we're really testing is we're testing the includes function that's part of JavaScript, right? Or we're retesting the return to make sure that the return returns what the includes function returns. Not useful tests, right? Um, unless you don't trust your framework and then you maybe you want to test your framework. But in most cases, you don't want to test your framework. Um, really, you just want to test um, the has property and then um, You know, and then just make sure that it returns a value. Um, so there are three branches through here, right? If it doesn't have the property, then it should return false. Um, if it does, then um, actually there's only two branches. It should just return this, right? Only two branches here. So I don't understand why this is a 6% and this is a 6%. Um, if we're calculating these. Um, and so I don't know where this complexity percentage comes from. Um, I would argue this is a higher complexity um, than this, but maybe maybe it's just the way that I think about complexity in my head, and that could be wrong based on the definition. Anyway, we committed that. <laughs> we got lost in the weeds a bit. Let's go. Let's go fix the other piece that I was talking about. So in the um, let's close all of this. Those all tabs. Um, so in the main article component, um, 
And now that we've added the um, the analog plugin for Tailwind, we get the analog um, symbol here that tells us that it's working. Um, and then down here, you can see we're running type, um, Tailwind TypeScript and ESLint um, on this file. And you know the reason we are is that it knows that we can have um, CSS inside of here. Um, but one thing it did call out is right here, this little squiggly under source. Um, WebStorm is smart enough to say, hey, we could use the optimized image directive to improve our performance. And we absolutely can. Um, because um, the way that pixum.photos works is that this seed of JSON is always going to return the same image. And we also know that it's 250 by 250 pixels. Um, that's what this means, right? We told it, use this seed every time. So it's going to return the same image. Um, and that's why um, in our code, when we look, we get this same um, image of the Eiffel Tower, right? Um, if I take the seed, or if I take this all out, I believe now we just get a random 250 by 250. Um, it's probably going to give me the same thing over and over again because I've already used it. Um, but um, by using the seed, um, and it, it might have cached it. So what if we go here? There we go. So now that it rebuilt, um, we can see that now we're getting different images, right? Um, and Angular can't optimize these. Um, however, if we give it the seed and we know that we're going to get the same value back every time, um, then we can do some optimizations on this. The first thing we can do is we can just say, hey, this is um, an ng source, right? Um, so there we go. Um, we should be able to import the ng optimized image. Um, and so we get that from Angular Common. Um, and I think we also need to do with, um, uh, I don't think we need to do that, do we? Yeah, we do. We need to put it in the imports. Um, so here we do with, we do analog um, imports. Um, and so now it's going to pick up the ng source. Um, but it's also telling us, hey, we require a width and a height or fill attributes. Um, so we could tell it, you know, use the fill attributes. Um, but we can we can just give it a width and a height, right? Width equals um, 250 and height equals 250. Um, and so now we've given, so ng source requires um, a width and a height to know how big to optimize the image for. Um, and so now that we've done that, um, if we inspect this, um, and we've got our width and our height and all of that stuff, as we're loading this, and it's, it's going too fast, uh, but it, it has optimized that image. Um, and, you know, if it was below the fold or things like that, um, you know, we would get benefits from that. And we can look at um, ng optimized um, image. And here, um, it adds all sorts of best practices to it, right? So we get fetch priority on the image tag. Um, so, you know, non-priority images get lazy loaded. Um, and, you know, we get a pre-connect link in the document head. All of this stuff is really, really good for optimizing our LCP. Um, and then um, we can get asset URLs if we're using image loaders. Um, but we get that all of this stuff um, 
we get all of these benefits, but we have to know the width and the height of the image before. Um, so I, I haven't seen the fill. Um, oh, got a cloud fair. I didn't know that it added these other. So it can determine where we're loading from, and lo that's cool. Um, we can use image loaders. That's cool. Um, so by writing our own image loader, we can just say, hey, use ng source and um, just use this file. Um, and that's really cool. Um, so we could write our own image loader. That That's really cool. I like that. Um, interesting. Lots of stuff I'm learning today. Um, but um, by adding the analog, um, the analog plugin, it was able to analyze this as Angular and tell us, hey, you, you know, we could use ng source, um, and we should be able to see some of the stuff for the ng source if we inspect this image. Um, there's our ng source. Um, yeah, see, it added the lazy loading um, and the fetch priorities auto. We can set these ourselves. Um, and um, so, and then it adds, you know, the source to it. And if we go look in the header of our document, um, we should see up here. Um, we're getting a whole bunch of style stuff from that. Um, it must not have needed to do anything with the head, um, but we can get um, we can get links. Um, it, it can add stuff here to make loading better too. Um, but we we definitely can see that with our um, image here, you know, we're getting lazy loading and stuff like that. Um, and the the nice benefit to lazy loading um, is that um, you know when if, if our image is below the fold, um, the browser can say, oh, this is lazy loaded. It's not visible. We'll, we'll wait to load it until I've, I've processed everything else. Um, and so, um, you know, as, as the browser is parsing the document top to bottom, um, having things like that where it can go, oh, I can worry about this later, um, and it can defer that to, to later loading, um, then it can move on, right? Otherwise, it has to stop and load that image and then, um, you know, there, there are optimizations that take place, but um, we can make the, the loading a lot better um, by um, using the ng source, right, the optimized image. Um, so another, another good thing that was called out by, um, by our, uh, our plugin. Um, so um, we just say that we moved to using optimized images or optimized image um, so there there's another nice benefit um, the last thing that I want to take a look at and this comes back to um, you know kind of me wanting to clean up my console is this hydration right we requested hydration um, but hydration is not enabled on the server um, it's telling us hey we need to provide client hydration um, and if we go look, so inside of here, if we look at our um, app.config, yes, we're providing client hydration. Uh, so that's right. Um, but if we look at our app.server, um, we're, we're providing server rendering. Um, and we're merging this um, s 
So rendering function, yeah. Set up the server. Um, and if we go take a look at analog, um, and if we take a look at server side rendering, um, so um, we had this issue. So in our Vite config, um, we disabled SSR. Um, and this is this is where um, I turned this off. So in the vconfig.ts, we've got this analog with SSR faults. Um, so if we open up the vconfig, um, and inside of here, route rules pre-render. Um, here it is, SSR faults. We turn this back to true, and we could even say, hey, we want to pre-render these. Um, let's see what we get. I think we were getting some errors. Um, uncaught, yeah. Whoops. Now it's telling me the site can't be reached. And I think the problem is we've got some issues. Yeah. Um, oh, it's telling me local storage is not defined. And now it's not rendering anything. So local storage is not defined um, in index.html. This is my problem. I caused this issue. Um, This is, um, I could probably turn this um, by saying pre-render faults here, um, but local storage doesn't exist on the server. Um, so yeah, local storage is not defined. Local storage is not defined. So there we go. Now we've re-rendered. Um, and... Here, we're still getting the local storage is not defined. Um, so that's not our problem. The problem is in the index.html, um, inside of here, we're using the Angular blog root. Um, and if we look at the um, app, uh, component, which is what sets up the Angular blog root. Um, inside of here, we've got our theme store. And the theme store, if we go look in that, um, inside of theme store, we're using local storage. Um, so here we're, we're reading local storage um, and because of that we're getting issues right um, i'm wondering it may just be as simple as saying hey if local storage is defined um, then use it if not don't use it um, let's see what happens there um, let's terminate this batch job and just Kick it off again. Because um, it's just telling us that local storage is undefined. Um, that basically means, um, yeah, local storage is not defined. Theme store line 16. Line 16. It exists on the window interface. Um, 
So it's telling us, and it's probably going to be easier to read this here, uh, but um, on init, so the theme store, um, online, where's my on init? Here. So my from storage is local storage. Um, and the problem is I don't have a window object. Um, and so it can't grab local storage because it exists on the window. Um, um, so I'm curious. And this is like, I, I haven't done a lot of SSR in Angular. Um, SSR Angular local storage. Um, there's probably a way around this. Um, and it looks like Stack Overflow already has the question. Um, platform ID, if this dot is browser, local storage. Um, So it looks like I don't want to sign into Stack Exchange. Um, it, it looks like we just need to check. Um, Frameworks architecture, since you enabled SSR in your project um, and you're trying to access local storage from a constructor or any possible, uh, will trigger SSR to throw. Yep. Um, so we need to inject platform ID. We need to check if it's a browser. Um, and if it is a browser, then we can run this. Um, so, um, We can just grab, we'll just grab this code and then we will modify it for our usages, right? Um, so here, um, because we're inside of with methods, um, we're going to need to use, um, well, in our with hooks, we um, we can actually run because we're in a cons um, an injection context here. Um, we can actually get um, our platform ID. Um, so here we can just say const um, platform ID equals, and now we'll just use a lowercase inject. Um, and we'll grab that. Um, so now we need to add inject. And we need platform ID from Angular Core. Um, and here we can just inject this too. Um, and we can say, hey, that. Um, and at this point, um, all of this stuff can be moved into here. Um, and that should solve it because um, now we're just checking, you know, if we're a platform, if we're a browser, and really we don't even need this. Um, we could just grab, uh, we could probably just do this. Um, if we want to. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about either, um, but um, that should allow us to enable the server-side rendering. 
Um, and now we've got problems because we've got collisions, but that's okay because if we just restart the server, all of that cache stuff goes away and our collisions go away and there we go. So now we're getting the, the nitro issues. Um, but if we go here, um, so now our app is server-side rendered. Um, and we're getting all of our stuff here. We're getting our hydration. Um, and you know our, our errors have gone away. We can probably go back to um, our Vite config, but we are pre-rendering the slash route. Um, and so now we're totally, um, we're totally SSR enabled. Um, which is awesome. We just turned on SSR, um, and um, we can probably see that in our network tab. Um, so if we pop this out, um, and let's go ahead and just refresh this. Um, and so here we can see, you know, it's serving up our local host. Um, and this is all static HTML, right? Um, we can see um, this is our response. So inside of here, the original um, local host gave us all of this stuff in our style. But in our body, we can see that our select is pre-rendered with these values, right? Um, so this is the static values coming from the server-side rendering, um, which allows the page to be, you know, not have to bootstrap Angular. Once Angular is bootstrapped, um, then it's going to take over, right? But until that happens, um, it will... Um, it's going to be running on a static, um, the, the static version of the page. Um, here, these web sockets are, um, I think this is the Vite server reload stuff. Yeah, the Vite hot module reloading. Um, so the HMR from Vite. So this, this web socket is just basically the application. When V says, hey, reload, then it reloads. And that's how your application knows to reload when um, you know, a recompile happens. Um, so um, yeah, that, so we just enabled SSR um, and we were able to, um, Oh, interesting. We've got a problem here. Our click events aren't happening. Um, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure what's causing that. Um, I'm also noticing that our theme is wrong. Um, so here, yeah, doing this broke a whole bunch of stuff. Um, interesting. Um, what if I turn this pre-render to false? Um, let's just see what that does for me. Um, go ahead and reload. We're just waiting for that to reload. There we go. So we're still broken. SSR is breaking our site. Um, and so in that case, we're just going to turn this to false. Um, and leave everything else as false. 
Um, not sure what is causing that issue. Um, and this is where uh, this is where I need to upgrade my knowledge. Um, I'm not sure what it is about the hydration that is breaking um, the click events and things like that. Um, but th this is definitely my fault. This isn't um, this isn't something that um, Angular or Analog is doing. This is honestly we're outside of my knowledge, um, and so yeah. Um, I need to do some more research on SSR, um, and maybe the best way to do that is just to bring somebody on who understands SSR better than I do, um, and we can work through it, right? Um, but I do need to end the stream here. Um, I had a lot of fun tonight. Um, I learned a lot. Hopefully you did too. Um, yeah, some crazy stuff that we, we discovered tonight. Um, be back on Thursday, where we will actually work on this page. Um, I'm going to say that, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens, right? I think we will. Um, but we're going to, this This will be our article page. Um, and then the other thing we're going to do is work on our articles page. Um, that will, you know, have more information on it. And then our home page. I don't know if we need the articles page or, I don't know. I'm still trying to think through that. Um, but as of right now, um, well, we would, um, I, I'm thinking that we'll limit the number of articles on this main page. Um, and then um, the articles page will hold everything else. Um, and so we'll need a way to get to that articles route too, um, which will probably be a link in the footer or something like that, um, which means we'll probably need to create a footer that will stay at the bottom of the page. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we will be back Thursday at 5.30 PM Mountain um, where we will be thinking about some more stuff about our blog. Um, once we've got all of the stuff in place, the next piece is to start using some sort of CMS um, to start feeding information to our blog. Um, the other thing I would like to do is investigate feeding Markdown from our CMS system into our blog. Um, so um, those are two things that I would like to figure out. Um, and then I think we're mostly done with the blog. Um, I do have an idea for what I want to do next, um, but I think I'll put some polls up on Twitter for um, what people are interested in. Um, but definitely look for those, um, well, Twitter and LinkedIn, right? Um, We'll, we'll run some polls to see what people are interested in. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. You guys have a good evening and we will see you Thursday.